Hello, friends. Welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me today for what is going to be a unique interview. I've never had an interview quite like this before, but I have with me today John Davis, who has a memory of a past life with Jesus. Maybe this is going to be a little uncomfortable or a little too far out there for some of you, but I have read and regularly promote the work of people like Dolores Cannon and Michael Newton. So I am very open-minded towards this sort of a thing. And I wanted to get John on here to talk and to ask him our most pressing questions about Jesus. And so this entire two-part interview I'll be posting today and tomorrow, John will share briefly how he came to this realization and the story of how he came to the understanding that he had a past life with Jesus, how this memory was uncovered. But most of our conversation is him sharing the teachings of Jesus that he remembers, as well as me asking him all of our questions about why did Jesus die on the cross? And what was Jesus's mission? What was his purpose? What did early Christianity look like after Jesus left? And many more things that we get into. John's links will be in the description, including his YouTube channel, where he has over a hundred videos where he shares the teachings of Jesus that he himself remembers, as well as his website where he offers people readings. He does have a discount for anybody who watches this podcast. He is offering $50 off of a reading. Thank you so much for watching. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am so excited today to have John Davis with me. I've really been looking forward to this interview. Thank you for joining me today, John. Oh, I am overjoyed to be here. I think we're going to have a lot of fun and hopefully, you know, help people find their own path. Yes, me too. And as I was just saying to you, I have so many questions for you and a lot of my viewers are from a Christian background and have deconstructed. And so I think this will be right up there, Allie. So would you like to start by just sharing with us a little bit about your own story and how you came to the realization that you had had a past life with Jesus? Sure, absolutely. I, I was raised in a very good Irish Catholic family. Um, my mother is, was so Catholic, she had her master's degree in liturgy and was head of liturgical doctrine at, at our church, which basically means when the priest wanted to do a sermon, he had to pass it by my mom, <laughs> right, right, right? And then she would say, kiss the ring and go ahead, you could do it. And then, um, but the, um, so I rose, I was an altar boy, I did readings, I did all the, when we were so, we were so Catholic, when it snowed, I shoveled the walks, right? So I was there, that's what we, how I was raised. Um, and as time went on, uh, and I turned 18, my mom, who was just a lovely individual, said to me, one of, the most, one of the best things that anyone could have said to me, she said, John, spirituality is a personal journey. You need to find what you believe. You know, I hope you'll come back and, and to Catholicism, but you need to look into it. And so I did, and I went and I studied I traveled all through the Middle East and India. Uh, I traveled to, down to Peru, and I and I uh, did sh shamanic things down there. And I was, I mean, I went everywhere. I do I dove into Wayne Dyer, and I started studying all these various things. During this time, I was also doing a comedy sword fighting show at Renaissance festivals all over the country, um, and I was a professional fight director and stuntman as well. And I was at a show in Ontario, Canada, and. I was sitting there uh, at this party and I looked across the room and this woman was staring at me, just really staring at me hard. And I was, I was uncomfortable while I was looking. Finally, she got up and she stormed across the room and she says, you know, you walked with Jesus, right? And I was like, what are you talking about? She says, you were an apostle. You walked with Jesus. And I was, I was, okay, lady, you know, back away. I'm going to get a restraining order. You know, it was one of, the, one of those things I, as a, as a raised the way I was, I wasn't a big into psychics or any of that sort of thing. So the more she talked and the more she would, she would not let it go. The more she talked, I finally said, okay, I'll have a reading with you. So we set up a reading. Um, 
So next reading, she got in more in depth about it. And she's told me more things about it. I was, I thought that's weird. And I went on my, on with my life. I ended up going to a holistic fair with a friend of mine because a friend of mine was selling uh, uh, pottery at this holistic fair. And I was walking around the holistic fair and I walked past the row of readers and one of the readers stopped a reading, stopped reading for the person, got up, ran out in the aisle, grabbed my arm and said, you know, you were John the Beloved, right? <laughs> I mean, this was like out of the blue. Well, long story short, 19 different psychics told me the same thing spontaneously um, and was blown away, blown away. Um, finally, being the, the science-minded person I was, I decided that I did not want uh, all the information to come from psychics. I wanted it to come from a more science-based approach. So I found a past life regression therapist and I said, let's see what we can find. And she, she uh, hypnotized me. She put me under and took me back. And I remembered the moment of meeting the guy that I called Jeshua Ben Joseph. And um, I remember him walking over to me and placing his hand on my, on my chest. And it was interesting because when I first saw him, I could feel his presence. I could feel this, this love emanating from this person. And he walked over and he placed, put, put his hand on my chest. And when he put his hand on my chest, I, I went into pure unconditional love without fear. And I, and I transcended this illusion that we all live in. And I, and I was experiencing oneness with God, oneness with the source. And I'm sitting there in, in the regression I'm, and I'm just moaning. And the regressionist says, she says, are, are you with him or are you him? Because she couldn't tell the separation. And my response was, I'm within him. That we were together as one. She says, let's go to the next important moment. And the next important moment was me standing on the beach, watching him walk away and feeling all my fears and anxieties again. Feeling myself back in body, experiencing, you know, the, the, all the things that didn't let me feel that unconditional love of God. So we keep going and, and Regressionist says, would you, how would you feel about seeing his death? Now, she, she thought she was taking me to the death of John. What she didn't realize was that the only important thing to John in his life after that moment was Jeshua ben Joseph. So, right? And so um, she takes me to the death of uh, Jeshua ben Joseph. And um, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know my Bible that well, I guess. But John was the only one of the 12 that was at the crucifixion. And I have visceral memories of him being crucified. And you hear me in, the, in my regression of screaming. And I mean, just, and, and she, had to, she had to take me out of hypnosis or down from the emotions because I was, in, I was inconsolable. Um, it, it really a profound moment. So the regression ended. I had this huge experience, but I had something that the regressionist had seen before, but she didn't have one of her patients have it. I started having spontaneous regressions happen in my, in my life, in normal daytime. I would go down the street and something would happen. It would trigger a response. And I'd see something and I'd experience it again or experience that, that happening in the other life. And I started to pick up some of the teachings. And one of the things that was so interesting to me was the teachings were, were less not modern Christianity, much more simple, much more simple. In fact, what I said in the regression was, in the, the original regression was, it's so simple, we can't grasp it. It's so simple that we, we take our brain and we wrap things around it to try to make sense of it. And that's how religion was formed. And that was how all these spiritual thoughts are formed because we're trying to make sense of something that's so simple. You know, God is love and we were given fear so that we can experience love fully. We're here to experience our separation by coming to this physical plane and having control of our fear and, and experiencing fear. And that was the main course of the teaching. What I've discovered since then is that when you apply that principle to your life, Everything changes. 
you know, you walk down the street and you're just emanating love and you feel this love inside of you, which is easy to find. I think we could talk about that in a little while, but when you're walking down the street, you're just, you're just feeling this love inside of you. You watch the people around you just smile. I mean, they just, they look at you and they do double takes like, what the heck's that? And they just smile. But it's, it's, you know, you have that expression of self that you don't have to go out and, you know, do all the little dogmas and, and um, ceremonies, you know, it literally comes down to just being love and, and you know, working through your fears. Thank you so much for sharing that with your story and then some of the teachings that you remember. I think that's really, really applicable to a lot of people right now, even more than ever, because we are experiencing so much increased fear and anxiety with events that are happening in the world. So maybe if you'd like to go into um, how do we find that love and how do we get control of our fears, as you mentioned. Great. So but before I do that, let me, let me dive into what you just said, though. We are mm-hmm. going through a lot of crazy, turbulent times right now. Mm-hmm. But there's a famous Socrates quote. When the debate is lost, slander becomes the tool of the loser. Mm-hmm. Right? And yeah. you think about right now what's happening is we are literally having a shift in consciousness. And the reason I can say that clearly is because I came out with this story 20 years ago. And I spoke at, at the Edgar Casey Foundation in Virginia Beach and in Houston and in Portland, Oregon. I spoke at Unity Churches. I had a book written about me back then. And what was happening back then, I, I stopped doing that work because I would go to a center and I would speak and they would get really wrapped into who I was mm-hmm. rather than what I was teaching. And, I, and I'd come back every year and they'd come back and they weren't taking the teachings. They weren't, you know, and I was becoming a crutch and a, you know, someone to go see speak rather than someone. So I said, I can't do this because it's not, it's not helpful. And it doesn't, it doesn't honor the teachings that I learned. I stopped doing that work altogether. And I went off and I became a, a corporate motivational speaker. Um, and becoming a corporate motivational speaker was interesting because what I was actually doing was I was teaching the principles in corporate environments without the past life stuff. Right. So I was kind of like using their vocabulary, right? And uh, positive attitudes and all all this stuff, right? And what was really interesting is when, um, well, basically I I, I met somebody that had that feeling that that I had felt before. And I asked her to become a co-host on a podcast that I have called Spirit Cafe Podcast. You know, it's our take on spirituality without the guilt or dogma of religion. And so I met her because I interviewed her for a corporate event. And then we got on the phone and we started talking. And next thing you know, I find myself telling her my entire story, right? Mm-hmm. And so now I'm telling her the story. Then we created this podcast together. She pushed me to, to come back out again. She says, it's different now. And then I ended up going over to... Um, uh, getting interviewed on Intuitive Views uh, YouTube channel by Kim Carey. Mm-hmm. Here's the interesting, that was seven weeks ago that that happened, all right? On the morning of that interview aired, I started a YouTube channel, uh-huh. okay? I had four subscribers. That YouTube channel monetized today. It has 1,200 subscribers. Wow. And a, a, and, and 111 videos in seven weeks. And why I love this story is because the people who are commenting and talking to me, and I'm talking now, are all about the teachings and not about who I was. Right. It's, it's a different level of consciousness from 20 years ago. We are literally getting into the feeling. Now, here's to answer the question that you originally asked, because I went off on a tangent on you. <laughs> um, the feeling, it's, you know, they call it the breath of God for a reason. Now, the second I started talking about this, I don't know if you can see this or not, the goosebumps and the hair started standing up on my arm. Mm-hmm. Because the second I even think about it, I feel it. Um, when we, let me put it this way, fear has a physical response, a primal response. Okay. Um, what, you ever watch National Geographic shows on TV? Yes. 
My kids okay. love them. Then you know that every episode has a doomed gazelle, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's a gazelle that's going to be sitting out there eating grass in the field, <laughs> right? And then the predator cat hits the field. The first thing the gazelle does is go <gasps> and gasp for air. It's the first, if you're a parent and you have children and you've seen your toddler almost fall and hit his head on the coffee table, you know you have gone <gasps> and you've done that, that gesture. That is a primal response to fear. Um, most people, when they get into a fear state, they don't think they can breathe. They say, oh, I can't catch my breath. I can't catch my breath. The body is, has plenty of air because what it actually did was it stored as much air as possible in your body so that you could run further and faster. Actors on Broadway, when they walk on stage and they forget their lines, they get into a fear response. They're literally trained to exhale and relax all their muscles. <sighs> what happens next on those, for those actors is all their lines rush right back into their heads because they shut off the fear response, right? That feeling of Jeshua touching me on the chest on that beach that day, or, or, or just even feeling his presence was there. When I exhale and I relax all my muscles, there's a tingling sensation that I get at the bottom of that, where it's all completely relaxed. And it, you have to really focus on it and get to the place where you can feel the sensation of the body. One of the problems we as mo in modern society have, ha have had is we've been wrapping things around the simple truth of it for so long, we can't get out of our head. Mm -hmm. And we need, to, we need to get out of here and back into our physical bodies and feeling the sensations of it. Because um, spirituality is not a thinking, it's a feeling. And so you want to get into the feeling space. So Everyone, if they, everybody's listening to this, give this a shot. Take a big, deep breath. Get as much air in your body as you can. You too, you too. Well, that's like you. And then just let it go. <sighs> Rather than, than putting words to it now, and don't tell me how you feel. What I want you to do is just focus on what it feels like. You should have this just well-being, relaxed, easy feeling. And the more you focus on that feeling, what happens is it starts to get bigger and broader, right? Right there at the bottom of your breath is the smallest little taste of that feeling. And when we get our mind wrapped around the feeling, it expands, it grows, because God works on focus, not on positives or negatives. You know, this is whatever you ask in God's name is granted. And, you know, God, um, Mo, uh, Moses said, God's name is I am. So whatever you're focused on in your present moment is what is, is being created. So if you focus on the feeling, the feeling grows. I have gotten this to the point with, for me in my life, what I do now is I, I meditate twice a day for between 30 to 40 minutes, usually closer to 40. Um, and all I do is that exact thing. I get that feeling mm -hmm. and I hold that feeling for that amount of time. What comes out after that is I'm so relaxed. I'm so in tune with it. And I know that when I leave the store and I walk out into the world, and I go to a grocery store or somewhere, and I walk along with that feeling, everybody around me feels it. Everybody around me smiles or says hello, or they do the things that we don't, you know, normally you walk through life, people are like doing their thing and walking by it, right? I will out there, I just, I put a smile on my face. I get the feeling and I watch people do double takes and then smile back. Right? Mm. It's a matter of literally walking through life. You know, the apostle John said, God is love. Well, if you can, if you can emanate love as you walk through life, you are, you are touching the source. And especially if you're loving them unconditionally, you know, don't judge them for anything, just love them no matter what, who or what they are. Well, and th think about this, you know, every spiritual tradition out there has breathing in it somewhere, you know, right. um, in Buddhism, you know, you got the, the whole breathing meditations and, you know, the, the ohm if said out loud is, is mm -hmm. breathing with, with sound. Native Americans chant. Uh, the shamans in, in Peru chant as well. You know, it's, uh, they're putting that breath out there. Now, I'll tell you an interesting, an interesting flip side of this. We sometimes get so trapped in our fears down here that we can't feel that love. Mm -hmm. 
And you know what that does? It sets up addictive behaviors. Yeah. And yeah. So say, for instance, I'm a drinker. Say this was alcohol instead of the sun kissed, right? <laughs> <You're> not <sp> <laughs> it's not sponsored, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. Say this was alcohol and I was an alcoholic. Watch, watch what an alcoholic does. They're like, I need a drink. I need a drink. <sighs> and they allow themselves right. to breathe. Say I'm a smoker. I get my cigarette. <sighs> Before that moment, they say I need a cigarette, right? Or in my personal case, I'm a pizza holic, right? <laughs> so I get my I, I get my slice of pizza. Oh God, that's so good, <laughs> right? Right? They take the feeling that they're not feeling, and they associate it with some substance. And what they're actually doing is giving themselves permission to exhale. Mm. And so they're, ah, oh, I feel so much better, right? And that exhale is, is right where the source is. You know, God, God, consciousness, universe, yada, yada, whatever you want to call it, is right there in every breath of your day. All you have to do is notice it mm. and, and focus on it because it walks through with you through life. Wow. Like you said, <laughs> it's so simple that we just miss it. Exactly. Exactly. And it's so funny. It's, it's when, when I look at the, when I look at the simplicity, I think it's so profound because if we're here to experience God by, through our fears, as I've said, which is what Yeshua said, you know, why would he make it hard? Mm -hmm. why, why, why would you have to do, um, you know, all these traditions and, and, and only pray for me in the church and only, only get married in the specific building and you know, all these rules, you know, and when you look at the, the Bible, it's been so, well, let's just talk about that for a second. The Bible originally was, was oral tradition and then it was written down and then it was translated from Aramaic to Greek, Greek to Latin, Latin to German and English and various other languages in each one of those cycles, it was translated. It was also interpreted. In, uh, in the 300s, uh, Constantine came in and said, take those 60 books and take them out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, what, what is our belief about Jesus now? Okay, is he a, a, a prophet or is he the son of God? Okay, we're choosing son of God. Okay, so now he has to be uh, unmarried. You know, now he has to be this, he has to be that. Yes, and he started, they started creating all these things around him. But, but my memories of Joshua is he's a man, and he's a man who understood his divinity. Now, he was a married man. I don't remember any children. People ask me that all the time. But he was, he was a married man, and he understood his, his divinity. And he said things like, you know, you are the children of God. And they referred to him as the son of God. You know, the difference between those two is one of them declared it. And the other ones hadn't yet, mm. you know, mm -hmm. so he just declared his divinity and lived it. And people ask me questions like, D -d did he resurrect? Well, I have memories of him where I carried him to the tomb. And I have memories of him after that as well. And people say, well, how, how can that be? I said, well, you can go to India right now. And you can hear them talk about the gurus who come to a river that's raging and they can't cross it. So what do they do? They project their consciousness to the other side and manifest their body right. around it. Right. That's all, that's all resurrection is, is, is resurrecting the body somewhere else. And so when I look at the grand scheme of, of the world and, and the grand scheme of everything, I, I, I believe, you know, that I am one with God, as are you and as everyone is listening right now. Right. But it, within that, within that vast God, is these individual consciousness, each one of us, right? We are our higher self. We are our Holy Spirit. And we come into this form to experience the separation through our fears. And so we come in, we experience our separation, and now we can go back and we can go, oh, now I can feel unconditional love because I know what the opposite is. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like basic science. You have to have a baseline to work from. Now, here's, here's the next interesting thing. You know, Buddha says, what you think you become, you create your world. Krishna said, you're the culmination of your thought, right? 
the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he, right? Noetic science, which is the Edgar Casey, I'm sorry, Edgar Mitchell, the, the Apollo astronaut had a transcendental experience coming back to earth and then spent the rest of his life studying what the heck it was. And they discovered that they can measure thought waves. They can literally measure thought waves. And they also discovered that when they, you take your thoughts and you point it at a very specific place, the thought waves stop at that place. Really? Yeah. They go to go to a very, so you can focus your thought waves and th they can tell something's happening in there. They just don't know what it is yet. So your thoughts are going somewhere and creating something. So your thoughts are creative. Now, how does that work scientifically? Well, if you look at the, look, look at your hand, mm -hmm. okay. Your hand is made of pure energy, pure atoms. And the eyes that you're looking at your hand with are pure atoms. And the air in between your hand and the eyes are pure atoms. Mm -hmm. All right. So everything in here is nothing but pure energy. Einstein said that atoms have nothing solid within them. They're just an energy right. event. So everything you're seeing and experiencing is God. Right. That's why they say we are created in God's image. Because every image mm -hmm. you see is God. Mm -hmm. And we're within it. And so... God also said, whatever you ask for is given if you have faith, if you believe. But the, the key phrase to it is, is your present moment. Because Moses said, his, God's name was I am. Whatever you ask in God's name is granted if you have faith. And it, all, it also said nothing will be impossible for you. Right. So you can sit here and say, I am receiving something you know, beautiful and joyful. Amen. And you'll get that if you, if you believe it. But the problem that most people have is they get very focused on the negative things that are happening in their life, right? Or even worse yet, they get focused on the lack of what they want. God never said, ask and it is given if, it, if I think it's positive for you. You know, it, it's an ask and it is given no matter what it is. And the way we ask is through belief, not through words. Mm-hmm. You know, Shakespeare said, um, words without thoughts, never to heaven go. And if you think about it that way, it's like, I can say anything I want, but if I don't believe it, it's not going to happen. Right. You know? And that's why it's thoughts, words, and deeds are the only three things you have in your present moment. Think it, say it, and then act towards it. Mm -hmm. You put those three things together, you can have anything in your life. I guess I should ask this question first, because this is a question from my 10 year old daughter. I told her I'm talking to somebody who had a past life with Jesus. And she said, ask him what color his eyes were. This is the painting I did of Jeshua from my regression. And if you look closely, his eyes are actually blue. And it doesn't make any sense for a, a Jewish man of that period to have blue eyes. Uh-huh. Because uh, you should have brown eyes. I recently kept saying, how could that be? How can that be? Someone just sent me a, a link to an Indonesian people who have the same coloring, the same kind of hair and blue eyes. And so it's possible, right? It's yeah. There. And the interesting thing is I interview a lot of near-death experiencers and they usually say that when they see him, he has blue eyes. And yeah. also, are you familiar with Dolores Cannon? I am. I am. Yes, because she said the same thing that he had <laughs> blue eyes and it was there was this I don't remember exactly what she said but a, a a line of people within his tribe that it was common for them to have blue eyes. Mm. He also I don't know if you saw that in his painting. His hair was 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 curly mm -hmm. but it had like hints of red where the sun had yes. reached it. Yes. Um the, to me when I when I look at this this painting I, I, I come right back to that same beach because, you know, it, it just stands out to me. I, I had to put that on the canvas because if I, if I would let that, if I forget that, I would just kill myself. <laughs> you know? right. Well, not really, but <laughs> I yeah. would, I'd be so upset if I didn't get that down while it was still fresh in memory. This painting was done back in 2000 and I was regressed in 2000. Okay. So it was the same year I was regressed. So that painting has been around for a long time. The other thing that I had with this painting is a lot, it, he, 
His skin is darker than a lot of the other paintings you see of him.